Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the webinar, Overcoming the Complexities of Building Accurate Universes. You'll notice that the, all the phone lines are muted. We are recording the session, and in an effort to make that recording as clean as possible, we will keep the lines muted throughout the duration of the session. If you have a question, please type it into the GoToMeeting chat panel, and we will get to those during our Q&A portion at the end. If we happen to run out of time, don't worry, we will be sure to follow up with you directly. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mike Bernard to get started. Thanks, Danielle. This is Mike Bernard, and thanks again, everyone, for joining the webinar today. Um, we're going to discuss understanding your requirements for ODAG and CDAG universes, analyzing complex issues that cause universes to fail, ex and examine common data mapping and validation changes and some of the strategies around that. With me today are our expert presenters and longtime partners from CareWorks, uh, Eric Willis, who's the Executive Vice President, and John Swisher, the Director of Solution Development. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to their very capable hands. Eric? Thanks very much, Mike, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening to some of those folks that are joining today's webinar. As Mike shared, we're going to spend a little bit of time at the beginning of today's session laying some groundwork on some of the topics that Mike laid out. Uh, what we're first going to do is I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking through the impacts of the Chapter 13 and Chapter 18 mergers that happened at the beginning of this year and its impact on the universe. Then we'll go into understanding your requirements specifically to ODAG and CDAG universes. And then as Mike mentioned, we'll talk about some issues uh, that cause universes to fail. You know, a lot of times when we're out meeting with customers, we hear a lot of these challenges that they run into. So we'll share a little bit of those challenges and some uh, opportunities to overcome. Then we'll move into some common mapping and validation challenges that we see a lot in with our healthcare payer customers. And then finally, John from our solution development team is gonna wrap up today's session with a demonstration of the Highland Appeals and Grievances solution. So you can see how technology can make an impact in reporting on your universe data and managing the process around it. So with that being said, well, as I said, I'll first start out with the impact of that merger that happened in February of 2019. So I'm sure everyone on this line, because you're all appeals and grievances and compliance experts, know that in February of 2019, CMS finalized the Part C and D enrollee grievances, organizational coverage determination and appeals guidance. And I know that's a mouthful, and it sounds like a really long, big document, but it's actually done a lot of positives for us as both a consultant and expert in the space, because CMS has really spent some time streamlining a lot of the regulation and guidance around the appeals and grievances process. Now, as, as I'm sure you're also well aware that that guidance went into a force immediately. But what from we've heard it from CMS and we've heard a lot of the conferences that we've been to this year is that they're probably gonna be a little bit more lenient on health plans in 2019 on those program audits because this guidance didn't go into place until February of this year. But as I mentioned, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen this, right? From our friends at CMS that we had these two different documents, right? We had our chapter 13 from the Medicare Managed Care Manual, and then chapter 18 of the Pharmacy Drug Benefits Manual. And there were a lot of times there's discrepancies between those two. It was hard to really determine how and when to perform different functions within the appeals and grievances process. And at the end of the day, it was hard to really understand what CMS wanted us to do, right? So I think one of the biggest benefits that this merger has done is it's made it easier to understand exactly what CMS is expecting from a business process for your appeals and grievances operations. And at the end of the day, that process downstream affects your universe reporting, your data submission reporting, et cetera. And then finally, one of the pieces too here that I think it does a really nice job of clearly defining the differences between Part C and Part D by having it in a single guidance. So, you know, before you had a balance between the two documents, this does a really nice job of showing where the process is the same and then where it convert or where it separates, where you've got Part C and Part D specific requirements based off of the plan. 
So looking closer from a universe perspective, what are some of these key highlights that change that we maybe need to be aware of? So I'm just gonna touch on a few before we move on to the next topic. So something like the AOR form on file. So, you know, as you know, the AOR form can be a critical component on when the actual start date of your appeal comes into play. Why that matters to your universe is that that start date triggers then your timeliness, your receipt date, et cetera. So one of the things that they've changed here is that the AOR form or equivalent can be on file and used by a health plan if it's been executed within that past year. So one of the things to start looking at as you guys evaluate technology is looking at a system not just manages my AOR process, right? Of just going out and creating the AOR letter, getting it signed, updating my receive date, but also looking at, from an AOR perspective, the ability for an application to keep the AOR on file in context to that member's record so that when the next appeal comes in for them, you're able to surface that executed AOR that's in play and in compliance and executed within that 365 degree window. One of the other areas that is a, a, a keen benefit here and something that I think actually helps out health plans a lot, but also something we need to be cognizant of when we look at receipt date for expedited cases, is that for both reconsiderations and redeterminations, we're looking at now the receive date on those expedited cases on not when that case or that request came into the mailroom, but actually when it finally got to the appeals department. So that 72 hour, win 72 hour window for the expedited case actually isn't starting until it actually gets to the department that can perform action upon that case. So again, when we talk about universe and managing the data, managing the process, we wanna start looking at how technology can foster that process to ensure that one, I'm getting the case routed to the appeals department as fast as possible so we're getting a good member experience, but that we're also able to adjust that receive date to properly document and process the case. The third one here that I wanted to point out was this whole concept of the ability to resolve a, an untimely case within that 24 hour period. So I'm sure we all know today that at that point when I'm untimely, I've got to auto forward that to the IRE, right? Well, now we have the ability that if we make a fully favorable decision, we effectuate that case and notify the member within 24 hours of the initial time frame then we actually have the ability to not send that off to the IRE, which again, if we look at our, our universe, that's something we need to be cognizant of so that we're not marking that and pushing that case off to the IRE prematurely and we're allowing that resolution to occur prior to that stage happening. And then a few other ones I'll just touch on, which more are a benefit from a process standpoint, but things like verbal notification, having three days to send written notice with successful verbal notification, and then the ability to send that written notice uh, within that applicable time frame. But I think one of the key things that, that we've seen too from a, an outreach perspective, because there's always been, this is one of these ones where we see so much uh, questioning from plan to plan on how to handle this, right? Whether this is for medical records, whether this is for good cause, et cetera, where I need that additional information, is that there was that guidance that came out with best practices, but it really wasn't in the document. So people weren't sure on whether or not they actually had to do the three attempts and how those three attempts had to occur and the time frame between those three attempts. So CMS did a nice job at outlining for outreach for AI that you only need to make that one attempt and then you can still follow best practices but it's not required so obviously you need to look at an application too that allows you guys the flexibility of meeting cms's guidelines while still allowing you guys to put your own best practices in place and have the flexibility that if you still want to reach out three times and have a consistent cadence to your member or to the representative or to the provider to ensure you're giving that member the best opportunity to get you the information to make a decision on their case, you can still have a platform in place to do it. Okay, so as we move on, the other piece that we, we always like to start off on working with our customers and we're providing some consulting is 
thinking through that they really need to understand their requirements for the universe, right? So we have, we have CMS, right? CMS is telling us what we've got to do. <clears throat> but in, in a lot of cases, you have your own interpretation of what that universe means from a reporting standpoint. And whether you're using an application today for managing your A&G process, maybe a, a third-party reporting tool, maybe you're using an FDR to be able to do this, one of the things we always um, suggest to customers to do is take that time to meet with your IT team, with your vendor, with your FDR, and ensure that what you believe to be the universe and how those data fields should be populated meet and connect back with what that system is that's going to be doing it. You can't just trust that it's going to happen. You've got to take that extra step. And what we always do with our customers is we do a little walkthrough. We say, okay, here's how we're going to process a case. Here's what our interpretation of how the, the technology will map to the data and the reporting. Let's see if there's any variances and then make those modifications where needed. A great example of that is, especially with like an outside print vendor, <clears throat> when we're talking about the date and time of when a letter went out the door. You may have an agreement in place with your outside print vendor that if you deliver the, uh, the letter files by X time per day, then they have a service deliverable guarantee to you that you can market that it got sent out the door that day. If it's past that window, then you mark it for the next day forward. So there's elements like that where we want to talk through with customers and ensure that you're understanding your other uh, um, SLAs you have in place with outside vendors map to what you want to be reported within the universe. The next two things to think about when you're thinking about uh, your understanding of your requirements for the ODAG is really looking at your process and ensure that your process produces measurable and accurate universe data. One of the things you'll hear me preach multiple times here before John jumps in to his demo is you got to look at technology and how that technology can drive your process and how that process drives data and reporting. All three of those pieces are connected. So one of the things that we always encourage people to do is leverage a system that allows you to test and monitor your universe data. The last time you want to be, or the first time you want to be pulling your universe data doesn't want, doesn't want to be when you get that letter from CMS saying you've got a program audit, and that's the first time you've looked at that data. You want to be able to leverage a system, which John's going to demonstrate to you guys uh, shortly with the Highland Appeals and Grievances solution that allows you to at any point in time be able to click on any of your universe tables in real time, see where you are at from a data perspective. It gives you the opportunity to proactively manage your compliance as an organization and have a team of people that are looking at your universe data. And so that when you get that, that engagement letter and you start to work with CMS, you don't need 15 days to pull that data. You can pull that data in 30 seconds and be able to provide that information to them. So again, I'm not gonna spoil uh, John's demo here, but he'll spend some time walking through, again, how the technology drives the process, the process then drives the data. Then what I'm gonna do here now is walk through a little bit of just some of the issues that we typically see that can cause universes to fail and some ideas on how to, to get around that. The number one issue that we see and the number one issue that comes up at all of the appeals and grievances conferences that we go to is that the initial classification of a case causes the either data downstream to be inaccurate or that it causes them to re have to reprocess work. They have to go back and bring back and redo work related to once they realize downstream they misclassified it from the beginning of the process. Now, what we see a lot is that you have someone in intake doing this that may not be able to evaluate correctly or have a system that allows them to evaluate that case correctly. So one of the things that we recommend is leveraging technology to help them make that decision, right? Let's, let's take all of the, um, the open-ended opportunities with a user and allow the technology to drive them towards the right decision. So it could be using something, which again, John will demonstrate here shortly, of 
how to use a classification form that's using simple, basic instructions to drive to a very CMS-oriented decision. So here I'm saying, okay, is this a complaint? Is this a request for something? Is this an inquiry? So I'm gonna say it's a request. Then from here, I'm asking the next question. Well, are they asking for a drug? Are they asking for a service? Or did they already get it and they have a payment issue or need reimbursement? Well, I'm saying they need reimbursement. So is that reimbursement for a drug or is that for a service? Okay, it was for a service. And then so immediately I know this was a request for payment reconsideration. That at that point, I then am able to then assign the appropriate SLAs, the appropriate assignment by analyst, the appropriate um, tasks, the appropriate data that needs to be pulled in, et cetera. And it didn't force me to have from the beginning an intake specialist be able to look at this and know immediately, oh yeah, this is a request for payment reconsideration and just move on. It allowed the system to walk them through the questions to get to the right answer. One of the other key areas that we see issues where, you know, universe data comes in, I'm, and this is a, an issue outside of A&G, we see this all the time, is that people live in spreadsheets still, right? Unfortunately, Excel is a fantastic tool and people use it too much as a crutch to get by. Um, and it's not just the manual capturing of data, right? We all know that data entry is an issue. Everyone here can fat finger something and put put the wrong information into that spreadsheet, which then downstream affects my, my universe data. But let's say you've got a fantastic spreadsheet with killer macros in there that are making sure that I've got drop downs and data sets, and man, my Excel spreadsheet is fantastic. It's gonna prevent me from having data entry issues. Well, your Excel spreadsheet doesn't manage your process, right? Your process, again, is what drives the data. So that spreadsheet's never prompting me as a user to enter in data when something occurred. When I sent out that letter, when I made a specific decision, I'm having to remember to go to that spreadsheet and log that data so that it can be used for downstream reporting. So again, it's not just data entry and, and, and clean data, it's that you had the data even to begin with because the process forced you to capture it. And then lastly, unfortunately, this is the one of the things we see all too often too when we're doing discovery and analysis with customers is that you've got someone next to a computer with a binder of their business process. Because a lot of times we see a lot of turnover, a lot of changes in departments with appeals and grievances. You're bringing in a lot of green people at times. And there are so many rules, right? So many steps in the process that have to be taken the right way that if you don't have a system and the technology in place to capture it, you're forcing people to have to live out of that binder and flip through the different tabs to find out what they need to do to process a particular case type, process an exception, et cetera. Same concept I'm gonna keep hitting home is, allow that technology to drive the process. Take that decision away from the user and allow the technology to make those decisions. Those decisions will then drive your quality data downstream. And lastly, before I turn it over to John to give you guys a demonstration of the Highland Appeals and Grievances solution, I'm just gonna talk through a couple common data mapping uh, challenges and some ideas on how to get around that. So we've got our case file. It's obviously filled with different documents, data, et cetera. If we look at something like our case disposition date, right? So this is the time, date and time that I made a decision on the case here at 627, I made it in the future at 1.42 uh, p.m. here. Now, as we know, as folks on this phone know, from a A and G perspective for your universe, I can't give them that nice, simple date and time. I first have to split out the date and convert that date to a year, month, day format. I also then have to change the time, put that into a second field and convert that into military time. So I'm not just doing data conversion, I'm also splicing data and then massaging that data to meet the specific format of your ODAG and CDAG universes. Another good example is something like case submitter, right? So my members submitted the case, right? Well, we know that for our universes, I can't put member or M for member. I have to put something like B for beneficiary, right? 
Now you might think, well, okay, that's not that big of a deal. I can, I can make member map over to B. Well, what about when we start seeing changes from CMS, like we're projecting for 2020, where then now they change that B to an E for an enrollee. So now I'm having to not just change my process to know that a member equals not a B now, it now equals an E. I am having to remember to do that translation. Maybe a different department manages my reporting. I have to now go tell them to do another change of translation. So again, leverage the technology to manage the process and create quality data. So one of the first steps to solve that problem, and I just hit on it there, report on universe data directly from your A&G application. More and more times we see where people manage this kind of, you know, uh, Frankenstein A&G application of spreadsheets and data sources and different reporting tools. And then at some point they have to extract all the data from their appeals uh, solution, send it over to a different reporting team that then has to manage that. They then have to make requests back and forth. There's issues with translation, there's issues with timing, there's issue with resources. So one of the biggest things to look at, it, look at as you evaluate solutions in the market is the ability to do all of my reporting directly with inside of my A&G application that's managing my process. One of the other key pieces of this, and this goes back just to the concept of clean data, right, is don't put the users in a situation where they have to key information in the system. Use lookups to your core systems. You know, go do a lookup to facets and pull information into your system. Use pre-existing data sets with member IDs, provider IDs, and do lookups into those systems. Use dropdowns so that you don't force individuals to have to key information in and have multiple variances of a defined field within your system. At the end of the day, eliminate those data entry errors. And then finally, and this just goes back to the idea of consolidation into a single system, is leveraging a single solution for not just your level one appeals, but also your level two IREs, your ALJs, your MACs, et cetera, so that when you do get to an IRE case and you make a reopen decision, you have to then go back and change the level one case. You're not having to go do that in another system, then remember to go back into your a and G application where your level one was managed to update that data so that your universe data is reported correctly. So again, uh, my goal here was to really set the foundation for John to be able to go through the, um, our, the Highland Appeals and Grievance solution and give you guys now a taste of what that looks like. And with that, I'll pass it over to John. Great. So one first thing I want to talk about that Eric had mentioned before is your classification. If we're not getting uh, a, a case, whether it's an appeal or a grievance classified correctly, a number of things are, are going to go wrong. A, we're, we're probably not going to process it under the correct time frame. We're probably not going to be able to process it with the required activities that we need to record uh, data for, for our, our universes. So what I want to go over real quickly is just in taking that general uh, case request and just showing the ease of use within an Outlook integration on whether or not that's a fax or an email, we can see all I did was drag this email into one folder. This case request is already inside of OnBase and identified as a case request. Uh, to this point, I have not even touched my keyboard. Um, if I close that out and come back into on base and I refresh this queue, we're gonna see that that has already been added to our request indexing queue. Again, we have not touched a keyboard. This has already been identified as a case request. Now, obviously if this is a medical record or that additional information, we can link it to an existing case. We can split this out if this contains both grievances uh, and an appeal, but getting down to just identifying and classifying that case, what our plan is to walk a user through that process in terms that they're familiar with, right? So what you're seeing here is what Eric showed a little bit of before in that initial classification. So while they're reading the content from that case request on the right, it's kind of walking them through and allowing them in their own terminology, in your organization's terminology, to be able to choose the appropriate classification. And this is gonna be dynamic 
based off of your choice. So as I read that letter, I can see things like physical therapy, and I see the word reimbursed and pay for therapy. So I know that this is a request, and I know that this is a request for reimbursement. And again, this form is gonna be dynamic to prompt me for the appropriate data based off of my previous selection. And I'm gonna say finally here that this is a reimbursement for service. And magically this form is gonna be pre-populated with a lot of data when it comes to that classification. So we're noticing that yes, this is a part C case and that it is post-service. The other thing that you're gonna realize is that we're recording that date time received. Again, Eric mentioned this earlier, but this is very important. So based off of your internal SLAs or when this has been received by your department and when this document came into the system, we're gonna do some legwork for you automatically and perform that initial date time received based on that document. Of course, you have the ability to utilize that or force your users to, to enter this information in. But one other point I really wanna drive home is that we're using a calendar pop-up tool, right? Keep in mind, I still have not touched my keyboard. So we're always ensuring that items are in the appropriate format. We're not worried about fat fingering anything for any type of translations downstream. So I'll come back up here and enter a few more fields. But uh, when we talk about uh, having a, a, a soft process flow, soft is different than flexible, right? So while we, we are containing a user and driving them through the process, we need to be prepared uh, to be dynamic and accept additional required information. So if I select that this submitter is a representative, which it is, if I scroll down here, we're now requiring additional submitter information uh, as well. So that way we can ensure when this, when this representative is validated, we can deliver uh, correspondence to them as well. Now I'm gonna cheat and use my button to fill out the rest of the form so we can see what that, that required and filled out form looks like prior to submitting it. Now we can ensure that we've added the appropriate information to this form to be able to create our appeal, but then also that we haven't, we haven't keyed in any data uh, that would require translation later on down the line. Now what OnBase is doing in the background is it's evaluating uh, items that, that we've, we've input into that form and we're figuring things out like the SLA, the path for that case in, in a general sense. And we know that, let's say for a, a, a representative, we know that we're gonna need to generate an AOR if we don't have one on file. And this is going back to that, don't utilize a soft process flow, right? Uh, we, what we've done is we've created built-in rules and paths and tracks, if you will, that will guide a user to perform the appropriate tasks. So A, they don't have to remember to perform those and then record that information, but also whenever possible, we're recording that information on the back end for them. Going back to Eric's point of that, that Excel spreadsheet, we're not manually entering any information in. And in the few instances that we do, we're choosing it from a dropdown so we can ensure that we're, we're not gonna have any missed translation of data. So because we're, we're guiding the user through that process to ensure that we're grabbing the appropriate metadata for that universe, we're getting a lot of automation for it uh, right out of the box. So when I go to click that generate AOR document, um, we already have all the metadata from the case. We know the case is guiding us towards this particular piece of correspondence. So I'm clicking generate letter. I'm not having to choose the appropriate template or piece of correspondence. Uh, the system knows that for me and it's putting all of that member informa information, the date that we've received uh, that appeal, who we've received it from, as well as the form itself and a barcode that ties it back to this appeal. So when they inevitably fill this form out and mail it back, again, we're, we're taking the keyboard out of someone's hands. They throw it onto a scanner and this will shoot right back to that case to be able to validate. Eric also mentioned on your, your outreaches. Again, so we're, we're only required to, to do one, but you have the option to automate that and repeat those processes, if you will. 
So not only are we, we adding that as an activity for someone to, to complete, but also we're recording all of this data that's so inevitably when you do get that program audit and you, and you provide your sample and now an auditor wants to review the history and what happened on that case, we're recording that this user did successfully reach that member. And if there were any notes that they, they wanted to add, we'll see that here as well as the time that they completed that. So we have a complete history of that, that case from beginning to end as well as all the metadata that we've recorded. Now we've generated our AOR, we've sent it out to the mail room and as Eric specified before, you know, we've already recorded the date that we've sent that AOR out. And that, that may not be a field that's required for the universe right now, but it, we're recording everything as humanly possible in, in the rare case that we do need that in the future, right? Now let's imagine that we fast forward a day and that AOR is on its way back in and it's been scanned, no one's had to input any data at all. Um, we've automatically associated that incoming AOR back to the case and we've created an activity for that analyst or specialist to process uh, to, to verify that AOR. So, you know, there's, you know, gone are the days of me as the analyst continuing to check back on a case to see what the status is or if I have any work to do. Uh, the system is going to remind that analyst that AOR has come back in. We need to verify it. And it's also worth mentioning here that if the system realizes that we have an AOR on file for this particular member within that 365 days, we're going to completely skip that AOR generation step you saw me perform before, and we're instantly going to go to the AOR verification step. And it's important that we verify it because, you know, maybe there's a chance that this is a different representative for that member that has submitted one. And if that's the case, when we click verify, we'll be able to see that it's maybe not the correct uh, representative and that we need to send a new one out. But as we can see here, this is from that same um, representative, Michael's spouse. And it, it's worth mentioning, maybe you didn't catch it, in that as soon as I click that verify button, we're trying to automate as much as possible and, and put uh, and remove as much heavy lifting from the analyst's uh, daily tasks. So as soon as we clicked it, we actually brought that returned AOR right up to the forefront and made it very easy for the analyst to simply click yes i do approve of the document or no now as soon as we've done that we have another interaction and this is one of the points that eric brought up earlier as well um, when we're talking about recalculating that due date we know that now that we have that required information we can recalculate what our, what our date time received is as well as our due date and whether, again, you, you want to be able to use that time that that AOR or waiver or good cause came back in or require your users to input this information manually, you have both options. But again, we're not ever typing those values in, right? We have a date picker that allows someone to just use a mouse. And we don't have to worry about uh, fat fingering anything or worrying about translation. So keep in mind, again, I still have not touched my keyboard uh, at this point. So I'll hit submit it's gonna cancel out that or close out that activity. And you're gonna see now that we, when we refresh this, that date time received is now that new date time received from just a little bit ago and a corresponding new due date as well. So as we process the case, we're waiting for a decision on this, whether it's an administrative or maybe a, a, an a clinical case, uh, we can fast forward even a little bit further now. Right, so in, in our case, an MD has made a decision uh, on this case, and you haven't seen it, but they chose that from a drop down. Now, something like MD Rationale will be able to allow them to free, free write uh, their rationale into the system, and we can translate that if necessary. But that isn't that isn't a universe field. So anytime again, we're we're looking at a universe field, we're having our users choose from a drop down, so we can ensure if we do need to perform a translation, we're doing it. And just as a reminder, we're guiding these users, if you remember through the AOR, through a process to, so that we can ensure we're always collecting the appropriate uh, amount of data. So again, it's back in my queue. And now what I need to do is verify that disposition or, or decision. And again, I'm clicking one button. It's going to ask me 
if I agree with the fact that this is a denial upheld. If I do, great, we're gonna generate that decision letter. If not, we can route it back through the process, back to the nurse clinician, back to the medical director, if at all needed. Now, if this was an overturn or maybe a partial, the big difference that you would see here is we would have an effectuation step prior to generating that, that decision letter with effectuation information. I'll go ahead and click yes. And then again, instantly we're gonna be able to choose that, that rationale. So you know, maybe the, the medical director has written a fairly lengthy rationale um, uh, for the purposes of recording it in the system, but maybe we want a member friendly uh, rationale that we're gonna put into the letter itself. And this is, whether this is a list that you'd like to use from the system or that you provide, we're, we're, we're translating that now for, um, for, for, your, for the member to be able to easily read. I'll go ahead and hit submit. And then instantly we're presented with that decision letter. Now I've kind of jumped through a couple places within that case, but one of the other things that's really important that may not uh, matter so much for your universe, but it does for the automation of your solution is that we didn't have to choose to send it to that representative any longer. Once that representative was verified within the system, the system knew to send it to Jan as opposed to Michael, the member. And we're gonna use that, the same letter and dynamically show whether or not this was denied or if this was overturned or partially overturned. Uh, you have all of that automated uh, right here behind, behind the scenes. And then when I click accept on here, again, you're not, I'm not having to remember to write down uh, the date, time of written notification. The system is aware of that. We have our, our pre-programmed logic in there based off of your mailroom SLA, or maybe there's an integration of them pulling that information back on when it was actually sent to the print room and mailed. I'll click accept. And one of the things I didn't mention before is that, you know, when I generate these, I don't have to go out and find that particular letter or that correspondence and add it to the case. All of those pieces of correspondence are being added to the case as soon as we as soon as we generate them. So we can see there's our denial upheld letter. So again, you know, inevitably when it comes time for that CMS audit, uh, you have those items and the entire history on the case itself um, uh, for for review. Now I'm going to, to refresh this case one more time and you're gonna see one more item that's changed on the case. Now we still have to perform our verbal outreach and formally close out the case where we're making those translations for your universe. The other thing we've already done because we know that this was not a full overturn is we've automatically created that level two case and we've associated it back to the level one. And this is something that Eric mentioned as well. So we want to be leveraging a single solution for all levels of your cases. And if we can, if we can see the true history of that level one that potentially uh, made it to a level two, maybe to a level three or level four, uh, we want to be able to track those together and be able to easily navigate between them um, fr from an audit standpoint and be able to see the history uh, of that case. The other thing that this gets us uh, very easily is the ability when we're generating that IRE case packet with a single button, because those two cases have automatically been associated with each other, we can go back to that level one case and grab that decision letter, that AOR that we sent out, the AOR that we received back, and, and at, the, at the click of a mouse be able to reorganize um, any of, any of these documents in order, uh, add additional documents if necessary, and then simply with one more click, generate that packet. Now again, uh, within this demonstration, I still have yet to touch a keyboard. Everything is very mouse driven uh, with the exception of potentially a, that medical director adding their, their rationale or notes that we've added or communication uh, amongst different team members. So what does all of this ultimately get us? This leads to a full and complete universe. 
Now, if I make my way out to what we call our, our filters or reports here, um, the big difference that you're gonna see between my demonstration and, and your product is simply that I don't have to enter in a date range, right? Because I wanna be able to click into these very easily from a demonstration purpose, but um, within yours, a click of a button and supplying that date range will instantly give you uh, your universe reports, A, to be able to validate that your interpretation meets the solution or FDR's interpretation that, that you're providing them, but B, to ensure that we have complete and correct data. And then lastly, just the ability to be able to export to Excel um, and, and, and provide that data in, in the format that CMS requires uh, is very easy with with the click of a button and lastly in addition to um, your universe it's worth mentioning that your quarterly data submissions that you're also creating uh, the system comes pre-configured with those um, as well so if we look at you know one of our historical ones from earlier in the year we're providing that date range uh, from 1-1 one, one to 331, and we're getting a complete and accurate count of all of your total grievances, the different classifications and categories of them, as well as the revised decisions for both Part C and D appeals. Um, again, all we're doing at this point is uh, entering in a start end date and then generating that report. So you have those counts instantly. And the nice thing about the new guidance is that uh, it's actually more streamlined, right? We, we have a lot less fields to report on and count on. So we know that our solution right out of the box is able to fulfill those needs uh, without adding any new workflow. We're simply just removing counts um, from that, that data submission reporter. John, if you could just go back real quick before we hand it over to our moderator for questions. If you go back over to your filters for the universe, the other thing that I wanted to point out that I touched on briefly, and I know this is test data that you're showing us today, but the other key thing that this is displaying here is not just the data, right? These are the actual cases themselves. So if you did find a issue with one of these cases, you can actually open up these cases directly from the screen right here, correct? Yep, absolutely. So not only to your point, is this a report, but it's a hit list of all of our active cases as well. Yeah, so the, you know, the key point there, obviously this is just some test data John has populated for the universe here, but that's a key component here, right? Is that I'm not just giving you data, I'm giving you actionable data, right? So we talked about earlier in my presentation about making sure that you can proactively use this solution to monitor and manage your compliance. Well, that's great if you're just exporting this data out to another system and some other person's looking at a report and they have to come back in and, well, hey, hold on, I found this one that's un untimely. Let's go find out what happened, right? Well, right from that universe that John had up, I could double click on that untimely one, open it up and look through the rationale, look through the decisions, find out why this didn't get done in time, what analysts were involved, what nurses were involved, what medical directors were involved, what was the root cause of us not being able to get this on done in time and have to auto forward it to the IRE. So it, it's key there that it's not just reporting data, but it's actual data that you can drive decisions off of and go back and understand what's going on within your business process. The only other thing I wanted to do to John before we open up the floor to questions and back over to the moderator is, and, um, is we get this question a lot when it comes to the universe data is, is the data, do I have the ability to modify those templates or create my own reports? Maybe I don't need, especially if I'm a compliance manager, right? And I want to be able to monitor some of my universe data, but I don't want to go look at every single individual table. Do I have the ability with this tool to be able to just go and create my own tables, my own filters? Yeah, Eric, absolutely. So if we look at, you know, th this is a list of my cases, and then we have, again, um, maybe that universe table, and we can see our different columns here. If I come down here to the bottom left portion of the screen and I look at user configured reports, I can easily create a new report uh, with the click of a couple buttons. So if I were to name this, 
MGR report. And I would say, yeah, let's report on those different cases. And maybe there's some areas that I want to be able to record, like the case type. I can select that, add that as a column. And maybe I want things like the member name. I can add that. And maybe I only want to see a case type of, a, of grievance, right, for this particular report. Again, very point and click friendly. If I come back to case type, I can ensure that, hey, I only want these to be grievances. And once I save that and run that MGR report, I'm only gonna get cases where we have that case type of grievance here. Now, again, this is a very simple two column report, but you can see how quickly I was able to just add the, the metadata associated to every single case choose from the fields that I want and then constrain it as well. Yeah. And you know, today the focus of today's webinar was on universes, right? In pulling universe data and how to have accurate data. But I think one of the things you hopefully saw today is that all of this data that's being captured through the process is obviously being used for the universe, but as John just demonstrated there, could be used for other reporting needs but also we have a, a full portfolio of real-time dashboard reporting to manage your inventory, manage the health of your A&G process, which I'm sure we'll go through in a, in a future webinar. But I think the key there is that because you're leveraging technology to manage this process, the wealth of data and insights and analytics around your A&G process is immense. And the ability for you to make long-term business decisions just continue to grow by being able to use a solution like that. So with that being said, um, Danielle and our moderator, uh, you want to open up the floor to some of the questions that have been submitted during today's session? Yes, thank you so much, John and Eric. That was, that was a great, great presentation. Um, the first one that came in is, how does your technology work when the member has more than one issue during a call? Say a grievance and an inquiry. Does your system open two separate records? Yeah, great question. And, and we absolutely do that. And, and we understand that that's a fairly common uh, common issue that, that comes up. So within that, that request indexing that you saw me in earlier, uh, you have the ability to create that case, but then you also have the ability to split that document, essentially copy it, uh, so that we can create two separate cases from that initial appeal. And what we'll do is we'll put a virtual post-it note on it saying that this document was copied for the purposes of, of creating multiple cases, one appeal or one inquiry and one or more grievances. Yeah, and, and the only piece I'll add to that as well is obviously the, the question there was related to two varying case types, right? of a of a uh, appeal and an inquiry or an inquiry and a grievance um, but another good example of that where we get this question a lot is how do you handle handle multiple grievances within a single request right so it's still one request but they have maybe they're complaining and having grievances about six different issues that occurred during this one element we have the ability in that intake form through just one intake method to be able to create multiple sub grievances, manage that as a uh, individual or manage each uh, grievance individually to a resolution. But then the key is that instead of hitting that member with six different resolution letters at the end of the process, we'll actually look at that parent. The parent will continually look at, well, all my children resolved yet? Yes, all my children cases are resolved. Now I'll go ahead and send out a resolution letter to that member that talks about how we resolved each of their six grievances, but then still reflect that reporting as individual items into the universe. And the same thing goes for incoming documents, right? So if we know that we need an AOR for that grievance, we know we need one at that parent level as opposed to asking for uh, an AOR six separate times on each one of those, those child grievances. Okay, the next two relate to the demo specifically. Um, does the member have to fill out the paper and then someone enters it into the software? It only depends on, on your organization. We've seen some organizations utilize a, a member portal uh, to where the member can input information to initiate an appeal or grievance. 
Uh, and what we would do is create a virtual document to bring that directly into the system. You know, alternatively, uh, if, if you are accepting those, those grievances verbally from your call center, uh, we've, we've also had your, your CSRs, your phone reps, open up that form that you saw me fill out without the existence of a document and start initiating that appeal right there while they're on the phone with that member. Yeah, the only thing I'll add to that as well is, and I think John makes a good point, is the, the technology can adapt to your process, right? So if you have a lot coming in paper, you can handle paper. If you got a portal, you can handle portal. If you've got member service, you can handle it that way as well. The other thing that we're starting to see more and more often too is integrating with whatever that member service application is. You know, we're starting to see more and more of Salesforce in the marketplace as a member services application. So we recently did a project where the case was the, the bulk of all cases were being generated in member services and a case was being created in Salesforce. Then that Salesforce data was being sent into this application to then create, manage the case. And then as we had updates occur in the process, we'd send those updates back up to Salesforce so that at any point in time, a member service rep could see where that appeal was during the life cycle of the case. Okay, and I think with your answer, you just answered this one, but I'm still going to read it just to make sure. Um, if the member gives ver verbal consent for the grievance or redetermination, is there a place in the form to capture that? There is, and, and that's going to depend by every organization. So it's, it's worth mentioning that you know what we see today is how the solution comes configured as soon as it's implemented into your organization. And we understand that you know, every organization has different interpretations. Every, every organization processes things a little bit differently and has different line of business applications, like Eric mentioned, whether you're using Salesforce or Facets or, or, or whatever it may be. So what, what part of our job is to do is identify the gaps between where, where our solution exists out of the box today and what it needs to be modified, if at all slightly, to fit your organizational needs and requirements. Okay, and then a follow-up to your um, call center comment. What if you do not want the call center staff entering the appeal into the system? Yep, that's a great question. And, and Eric kind of alluded to that before. So we don't want the, our CSRs with direct access to the application itself for creating appeals. Chances are they're going to be recording it in, in whatever application they're using today. And then through an integration with that application, whether it's direct and we're creating a case from, from their application or we're creating um, a virtual form, if you will, as a represent, representation of a document, waiting for an A and G intake person to make that, that translation, read through that document, and ensure that they're classifying and filling out that case creation form appropriately. Uh, we have a lot of flexibility as to how that case gets initiated. Yeah, regardless of how it gets captured from member services, I 100% agree with whoever asked that question. You do not want member services creating a case, right? But you want them to be able to capture case data and get it to the appeals department with the appropriate information so the intake specialist can classify it and get the case created. And that's as John alluded to, we have multiple mechanisms to ensure that Member services has doesn't have to do duplicate data entry. Your team doesn't have to do duplicate data entry, but we're not putting any risk in play by having member services be able to directly create cases. All right, and then the next question is, um, with the pending changes of table consolidation and field value modifications, how does your system adapt to those universe changes? Another great question. So uh, I, I alluded to this a little bit before, but um, beyond what is required out of the universe today, uh, the, the cases themselves going through the, the automated processing are collecting a plethora of data. And I'll throw one example out there from the past recent change was something like the AOR receipt date because we are already requiring that and already tracking that value, you know, changes to our solution that we're keeping up to date anyways, were extremely minimal in that we simply needed to add that particular field to a set of new tables. Um, so chances are, you know, we're already recording that data that the CMS may require in the future. 
And then additionally, because we're keeping our product continually up to date, you know, part of our responsibility is to create that, that crosswalk and then pass that crosswalk over to uh, our customers, giving them a highlight of changes between, you know, what the existing configuration for the universe is today and what it will be when that change takes place. Yeah, and the only thing I'll add to that is that, you know, we have our we have our compliance team that's going through that crosswalk as as John mentioned. And then when we create that change log of uh, you know 2019 or 2018 to 2020 or, or whatever it is, and whether that's for the universe, whether that's for you know data submission or quarterly data submissions. Then what we do is we publish that change log and then you as a customer have the ability to implement that change log yourself or engage with Highland to implement that change log uh, as well. Great, and then the last question is, um, does this application only work for Medicare or can it be used outside of the Medicare space? Yeah, no, good question. Obviously today's focus was on Medicare, right? Uh, those ODAG and CDAG universes are specifically tied to uh, Part C and Part D. However, yes, you know we have a, a number of customers that leverage the Highland Appeals and Grievances solution uh, for the Medicaid space as well as commercial. We actually have three distinct solutions that are designed specifically for the needs of each core line of business. So today when John was going through his demonstration and walking through the universe, he was demonstrating the uh, Highland Appeals and Grievances solution for Medicare, but then there's a separate application for Medicaid and a separate application for commercial. The nice piece about that is that one, it allows you to, to handle the distinct needs of each line of business while still creating a, a consistent user interface. So if you have individuals that cross train between departments, they have the ability to handle a Medicare case, potentially handle a Medicaid case, switch between applications, but it's only one application they're opening. They, you know, they have apps within it, right? So I can switch between Medicare, Medicaid. It has a consistent look and feel. Um, but again, the, the benefit there is that it comes out of the box designed to meet the specific needs and problems related to that individual area. On the commercial side, we have a, a plan matrix that allows organizations that have complex commercial plans with uh, variable service level agreements across every single product that they bring to market to map those individual tasks, SLAs, work streams, et cetera. And we have something similar on the Medicaid side, especially for organizations that do business in multiple states. Um, we have the ability within our Medicaid solution to be able to map in the state specific requirements for each state. So from a processing perspective, we'll evaluate that plan ID, determine whether that's Medicare, Medicaid or commercial, then populate into those individual applications. And then from there, follow the defined rule set for processing. Great, and that was it for the questions that were submitted. Okay. Well, uh, thank you everyone for those questions. We had some really good ones today and thanks for everyone's time. Um, tomorrow afternoon, everyone who attended and those who registered will receive a recording of today's presentation and then you'll be able to follow up with individuals based off of that email as well. So again, thank you very much for the time today. I think we had some good interaction, good questions, and hopefully we're able to, everyone was able to walk away with a little bit new information. So. Have a great afternoon.